Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we've gathered today to celebrate the life of Charles Thomas Gibbons. We're here because of our love for him and his love for us, for the gift of love that he gave to us, for this precious family. We pray you will comfort us all today. And on this Good Friday, O oh Lord, may we be keenly aware of your love for us, that you died on the cross so that Easter might happen, and that we might be given the promise of resurrection and eternal life. Comfort us today, especially comfort us and our belief and our knowledge that this life is not the end, but that we'll see our wonderful father and husband again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a uh, Sailor Tom song from Katie. So I am more of a pianist than I am a ukulelist. Um, but this is a song I wrote for Grandpa. He's a big storyteller. <laughs> my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we have uh, Pachelbel's Canon by Sylvia, Linda, and Katie.
And uh, Christy has prepared some words to share. I am here to speak for our father, Charles Thomas Gibbons. When he was a boy, he went by Tommy. He was in ill health these last few years. His memory was going, and he could no longer do the things he was used to doing. We would often hear him utter the words, what the hell? <laughs> if he lost something, couldn't get his blanket straight, or generally any time he was frustrated, we heard, what the hell? <laughs> the blessing of these last few years is that we got to hear his stories. So now we would like to share some of them with you. Tony was a risk taker, born of risk takers. His mother, Margaret Jones, once swam across a channel that only boys swam. His father, Bill Gibbons, was a World War I veteran and a fire chief and an honorary Seminole. At an early age, Tommy showed his intrepidness by telling his mother he was going camping out on an island in the Kalahusahatchee River down in Fort Myers. His parents bought him some food and a waterproof blanket and dropped him off. He spent a week out there fishing, catching clams, and cooking his food over a campfire. He was around seven years old. <laughs> Next, he and a friend decided they would like to make some money. They thought selling alligators was the way to do it. They used a drift boat to float down the river as they ran their hands up under the embankment, looking for eggs. Then they buried them in mud in his friend's backyard. That boy's father was not pleased to find baby alligators running around his backyard. He beat his son, and then he went to Bill so that Tommy would also get beaten. He never did get in trouble. As a matter of fact, later that year, Bill paid $2 for Tommy to ride an alligator. It was enclosed in a very tight rectangular structure where dad lasted a few minutes. <laughs> Around the age of 10, Tommy and his buddy decided to run away. They hitchhiked, topped trains, and worked at farms for food. They made it all the way from Florida to Texas when Tommy felt homesick and called his mom. His friend kept going. Margaret called the police, and they came over and put him on a bus back home. The policeman gave him a few bucks and told him, I would have given you more, but I was afraid you would run away again. Tom didn't mention that he had only 50 cents in his pocket when he did run away. Instead, he went into a store, bought a Western, and entertained himself by reading the entire trip back. The family moved to California briefly, then over to Georgia. Bill and Margaret were having some troubles and Tommy was acting out at the Catholic school. He nailed a nun's chair to the floor, and he cherry-bombed a toilet. It flooded so badly they got out of school early, and he was so pleased with that, that next time he brought several cherry bombs in and went into the hallway where there was lots of windows and set those off as well. He never got caught. Once, as an altar boy, instead of speaking in Latin to respond to the priest, he opted for pig Latin. He did get in quite a bit of trouble that time, but he gleefully told the story for many, many years. He ended up dropping out of school around the ninth grade and going to work with his uncle George in landscaping. He had a great deal of respect for his uncle. At the age of 16, he signed on to the Navy. His mom had to agree to this and made him promise that he would never get a tattoo. Although he always wanted one, he kept that promise. His ship had already sailed, and he had to play catch-up trying to reach it. When he finally did, quite some time had gone by. The ship chaplain came to see him and asked who he had written to his mom. Dad replied that he hadn't, and the chaplain said he knew that, as his mom had reached him. He told Tom to write his mother a letter, and so he did. The letter said, Dear Mom, Hi, Love, Tommy. <laughs> He traveled all over the world in the Navy and later worked for NASA. He was a second-class radio man on the ship, the USS Columbus. On one occasion, he was on a train traveling through France. The train had a stop in Bordeaux. His friend decided to jump off. Tom was worried he wouldn't make it back in time, but he did, with his arms filled with wine bottles. The two of them had a very enjoyable rest of their journey, as did their fellow travelers. One of his favorite places was Trinidad. He would go to a nightclub at the top of a very tall building. He would have a few drinks and take the elevator to the street to an oyster shucker, then back up for more drinks. 
He remembered loving the steel bands playing, but thought it was odd that the bathrooms were co-ed. When Tom worked for NASA, he tracked spacecrafts during the Mercury missions from the Caribbean. My sister Karen found something pretty special in one of our dad's albums in his room, and I would like to share it with you. It was a letter from the head of NASA's communications. In part, it read, it was through the broad knowledge of the AMR communications network and facilities by Mr. Thomas Gibbons that ultimately resulted in activating the AMR facilities and gave us the diversification needed to accomplish our ground communications mission. I would appreciate it if you would see that this is made part of his permanent record. We all thought that was pretty cool. One of the stories he liked to tell about that time period was on Aruba. He had gone to the beach and put a nickel in a machine to get a beer out. He chugged it down and then went for a swim out into the ocean. He was out in the water when he saw a fisherman waving his arms dramatically. My dad swam over and the fisherman told him he had been swimming with a shark. So my dad jumped into that boat and they waited until the shark went away. And uh, then the fisherman said, okay, you can swim to shore now. And my dad was like, hell no, you're taking me back. In 1965, Tom met Joanne. They were married after three months. They lived in five states. They raised four daughters together. They had many incredible vacations. In his last years of life, Joanne cared for Tom. And when he breathed, breathed his last breath, her hand was on his heart. And she told him that she loved him, and that they had a good life together. My sisters and I have many great memories with our dad. Going around the country in our camper, camping, canoeing. He would wait until we were good and hungry on the canoe before getting out the sardines and banana sausages. <laughs> and we would devour them. In the winter, dad and his buddy Larry would drill a hole in the pond to check if the ice was deep enough. Where's Jennifer? Remember that? <laughs> When it was, they would build a fire next to the pond and we would all ice skate. Dad used to tie a pillow around his butt because he fell so often. One night, he and Larry had so much beer sitting by the fire, they didn't realize their boots were burning. When my sister was Kathy, when my sister Kathy was 11 or 12, we were living in Florida and her bedroom was on the first floor. She used to sneak out the window and around the house, then silently roll her mini bike to the road and down the block before jumping on to go party with her friends. Many years later, <laughs> Dad told us that he used to smoke cigarettes on the balcony and watch her <laughs> and think to himself, she's just like me. <laughs> Kathy and Dad shared a passion for relic hunting and spent many hours in the woods searching for treasure. When they got hungry, Dad once again would pull out those sardines. When I was 10 years old, my dad took me driving on a beach in a rental car. While on the beach, he turned to me and told me it was my turn. I was awful. The car was bucking and jerking, and I'd slam the brake on too hard. A car pulled up next to us with some very angry men in it until they saw who was driving. Then they looked at my dad and told him he was one crazy son of a, and you can finish the rest of that sentence. <laughs> my dad taught me to drive stick shift, though I don't do it well, and how to shoot a gun. He used to visit me in college. Sometimes he would take me to a nice Italian restaurant for dinner, but my favorite was when we would share a six pack on the JMU Hill overlooking the football stadium and just sit there and watch the game together. My senior year, I told him I was going to backpack across Europe with two other girls. He said, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. He said, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. I have the money and I'm going. A couple hours later, he called me and he said, okay, I have the points. You can go for free and I have enough for your sister, Kathy. I was like, great. A couple days later, he called again, and he said, you can either go first class or you can take your cousin Brandy. I said, awesome, that's a no-brainer. So the other two girls' parents told them absolutely they may not go, and because of my dad, the three of us had a great adventure. Kelly's favorite memories were when they dropped a car and spent the day in the canoe, often camping overnight during the trip. Kelly always sat next to my dad at dinner. That was her chair, and we all knew to stay out of it. Woe betide the person who sat in her chair next to dad. Right, Randy? <laughs> Karen shares a love for gardening that comes from both of our parents as well as their parents. Dad had a very large garden and his mom was president of a gardening society. 
Karen remembers one day playing along the bank of a creek as Dad fished when a bee stung her. With no first aid available, Dad chewed up part of his cigar and put it on the sting to draw the poison out. He knew how to take care of his girls. Her favorite moments with Dad were quiet ones, driving in the car, making soup together, or just sitting in the living room. Our dad had many passions. He loved camping, boating, fishing, golfing, relic hunting, crossword puzzles. He was an avid reader, and he loved his dogs. Also the cats, but really the dogs. Um, he had a rich, beautiful life. So today, instead of sadness, we would like to celebrate a life well lived. The next time you have a drink in your hand, please raise it for our father and say, what the hell? <laughs> well, I said it was one thing to speak unless my wife made me cry first. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> I guess what I'd like to do is just talk about my relationship with Tom from the vantage point of a son-in-law. So, well, we've all heard the expression, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I could say that uh, getting a new father-in-law is more like opening a mysterious shoe box that you found in the back corner of Aunt Kate's room. <laughs> you really have no idea what you're going to get. Relevant. <laughs> but I think I got lucky. Um, for a dad with four daughters, Tom was always very welcome, welcoming to me as his first son-in-law. Um, I knew I was breaking new ground into his family, and I did get lucky because I knew we had some things in common immediately off the bat. Um, we were both Civil War buffs, um, loved talking Civil War, and we both had a love of golf. And there was always an activity that he and I could do together, which was go out and golf. In fact, he was the one who bought Tommy his first two sets of clubs. So he bought Tommy clubs when he was really little. And it created something that was very special to me because it was three generations of us going out and playing golf together. And we thought it was so neat that, you know, he started that with me, Tommy, and himself, you know, playing golf on the outer banks. And then eventually I recreated that at home with my mother. And we had the same thing, three of us together. And I forget if it was once or twice, but the four of us played together. Yeah. And I know all of us really cherish that. Um, the other thing that I enjoyed from Tom was his perspective when we took him to one of Katie's soccer games. Um, he kind of brought a unique perspective to the sporting arena. Um, so in the beginning of the game, I don't know if you remember this, but a girl knocked you down early in the game. And I know that bothered Tom. So he watched that closely the rest of the game. And I'm not saying that we, uh, you know, turned him into a soccer fan. I don't even know if he knew the score of the game at the end of it. But he damn well knew that Katie owned that girl the rest of the game. <laughs> and he was so proud of you for that, for getting up and knocking her down. Uh, oftentimes when we were at the woods house or the beach house, um, we'd end the evenings and a lot of times he would go out and read a book or smoke a cigar. But every once in a while, he'd go into story mode. And those were the nights that we'd all grab a beverage and just sit around and listen to him tell their stories. And the stories were always entertaining. And he really did have a tough, adventurous life. And the nights that we sat around and listened to their stories were always fun. It was always an addition to the trips. I think the, uh, the day of Christy and my wedding was probably one of the funnier interactions I had. <laughs> and it just gave me an early insight into how my new father-in-law operated. So picture, it's like an hour or two before the ceremony. And I'm out there pacing the yard. And Tom and Larry, they're over behind these trees with either Budweiser or PBR cans in hand. And I get this, hey, come here, we need to talk. I'm thinking, oh great, here we go. This is going to be that take care of my princess speech or something like that. <laughs> Instead, Tom hits me with, you better stand up for yourself, because if you let her, she'll walk all over you. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, thank you for that little joke. <laughs> I'll park that in my already crowded headspace, and I'm going to go back to pacing in the yard. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, but... 
he knew that he and Joanne had raised four very strong daughters, and he was proud of that. Uh, so then after, after the wedding, he calls us into the kitchen, and he thanks us for keeping the cost of the wedding low. And next thing you know, he gets out this little roll of $100 bills and like some sort of game show host. He counts them out in my hand. So I'm watching this, and then I kind of get in game show contestant mode. I'm like, okay, so wait, hold on, let me get this straight. I get the girl, I get membership into this awesome family, and I get the cash. <laughs> I don't even need to see door number two, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have shared that one. Before. So in conclusion, I just like to say that not a day goes by that I don't give thanks for marrying Christy and becoming a member of this family. Tom was always very welcoming to me as father-in-law. And I always appreciated him for that. So in the end, this shoebox wasn't that scary. <laughs> it actually had everything I needed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Patrick. I am Mary Ann Patrick's oldest son, who is Tom's sister. And I only have one short memory of Tom that I wanted to share with you. Um, I came down here on my parents' convocation. I couldn't have been more than 10 or 11. And Tom was there at the table, and I remember asking him, so, you know, what are computers like? And he goes, computers are very simple. They're just ones and zeros, all right? And they do it very fast, though. So I remember that, all right? And I went on to make a career in computers, right? He, 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 he did that. He also had plenty of novels that I was reading, including several novels that 11-year-old boys should not be reading. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I had a lifelong love of reading, and I made a career in a computer science. Thank you. And so for that one day, 50 years ago, I came down here today from Boston to thank Tom and to just express my envy for you that have enjoyed a lifetime with him. Because I'm sure you loved him, you know, as much as I loved him in that single day. He was a wonderful man. Thank you. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. And the Bible can be hard to understand. Uh, when I was a boy growing up, 
uh, some of you were Catholic, you probably heard the Bible read in Latin, and you probably couldn't understand it at all. I was in a Protestant church, and I heard it in what we call the King James Version. Are you familiar with the King James Version? King James Version was published in, what year? How old do you think it is? Huh? Over 400 years old. Came out in 1611. And, uh, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, everybody was still reading an old English version of the Bible. It wasn't until 1970s that, uh, that new translations came out of modern English. So when I was growing up and reading the Bible, I read this phrase, Charity never faileth. I didn't have any clue what that meant. And uh, I heard it over and over and over again in church. What does it mean, charity never faileth? And then one day, somebody gave us a new translation where it says, love never ends. That made sense. While we were gathering here a while ago, I was looking at these pictures. Uh, I was especially touched by uh, one of the earliest. Now, I think he's sitting in a wagon, and he must be about four or five years old, something like that. I noticed, uh, like me, he loves dogs. And uh, I saw, I don't know that I saw a single photograph that didn't signal joy and a lot of life, which is obvious now. And love. And you know, life can be kind of harder than a little four year old boy. He doesn't stay poor forever. Years go by and he leaves home and gets older. And after a while, the hair turns white and we get wrinkles and our hair falls out and we lose our health. And we don't wish that on anybody, but that's what life is. We all grow old and then we come to a day like this. But hey, if the Bible is true, this is not the end. Love never ends. There's far more cause today for your laughter than for your tears. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, Yet shall he live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Heaven is for real. And you'll see Tom again. Well, we had a request for a song, and I don't know that Joanne knows it, but I usually sing. So I'm going to sing the song that you asked for. And if you all know it, you can join me on the chorus. Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great. Shout of acclamation and take me home, 
What joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Dear Lord, what a wonderful family you have here today to celebrate a triumphant life. May we all love life as he did, and may we all have faith that this is not the last day but only the beginning of life forever in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the service will conclude at the graveside. Farewell, comrade. Rest in peace. Ma'am, on behalf of the President of the United States and this grateful nation, please accept this flag as a symbol of appreciation for your loved ones' faithful and dedicated service to our country. God's peace be with you. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, you want me to take them on the deck? <laughs> yeah, it kind of adds a <laughs> rhythm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
sailed away across the ocean blue, did all the things the nuns told him he meant.